This is Green and Gold History. 50 plus years of stories, championships, and colorful characters. He's the world champion. This is Ace Baseball. This is Green and Gold History. This episode of Green and Gold History is presented by New Era. New Era Cap is proud to be the official cap of your Oakland athletics. Next time you visit the Coliseum, be sure to drop by the New Era Cap stand and pick up your A's New Era Authentic Collection Cap. Remember, you can always visit us at neweracap.com to shop our latest selection, including our limited edition and exclusive drops. New Era Cap, the official on-field cap of Major League Baseball. Top 10 postseason innings in Oakland A's history, and I know our fan base complains a lot about the A's and haven't won a World Series since 1989, but the reality is the A's have been in a lot of postseasons since they've come to Oakland way back when in 1968. Yeah, that's the thing. There's been a lot of October baseball with the A's. Now, when there's you know, the A's in the franchise history, and we've talked about this, is they're either very good or they're very bad. It's very rare that they're a middle-of-the-road team. Uh, the Bob Guerin year is kind of being the exception. That was, you know, the middle-of-the-road, boring baseball. They're either really bad or really good. And luckily, in their time in Oakland, especially now over the last 21 seasons, they've been very good and playoff bound. And they've been playoff heartbreak, for sure, a lot of playoff heartbreak. But there have also been some spectacular innings, and that's what we want to talk about today. All right, you bring up that. I think of the one year, because it's the only year for me personally that I did all 162 games. I did every single game. And that was the Bob Guerin year where the team went 81 and 81. And it really isn't real because if you remember the the last, they were down four games and they went up to take on the Mariners and they swept a four game set against a Mariner team. Like you didn't know who any of the guys were. They were all minor league players. Uh, it, it was, it was like playing a double a team. What year was that? That was 2010. And that was the 81 and 81 year, which was just peak Bob Guerin. Right. I mean, just and you looked at the team, and there was just there was nothing that excited you. This was Derek Barton, yes. this was Kevin Kuzminoff, Cliff Pennington, Gabe Gross, Ryan Sweeney. I mean, it's just nothing that got you excited. Nothing that got got you excited for the future, and that's part of the problem when you're in the middle of the road team. Right? You think, you know, when you're really bad, you start thinking about prospects coming up, and you think about kind of like the A's in the 2017, where all of a sudden you're seeing Chapman and Olson starting to play. Well. You didn't have anything. You didn't have anybody coming up that you were really excited about. And that was 2010. That was the year of like, like every guy they brought up was named Matt. And who, <laughs> who, who was, who, I mean, one of the, he ended up playing for the Dodgers, but who was the Matt that ran right into the center field wall? He was playing in center field. Yeah, Matt Carson. Matt Carson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, I'll never forget. I was like, do you really not feel the warning track? I mean, and, and I'll never forget after that year. It's like I did every game. I was so burnt out and I'll go, I'll never do that again. Cause I was so burned out after doing every single game of that season. Yeah. Especially when it's just a, an 81 and 81 year when you're like putting your hopes on Travis Buck. It just, it's just not good. I still have the Travis Buck bobblehead doll. <laughs> <laughs> Along with like the super cuts barbecue set. If you remember that. And that oh, I is, do remember that. And oh, that is yeah. going way back. Uh, all right. Do you have honorable mention for us? Really just one. And that's the, the pre Oakland era. And that's probably the greatest postseason inning maybe ever. And that was the Philadelphia A's in game four, of the 29 world series. Uh, they led the series two games to one. But going to the bottom of the seventh, they trailed eight to nothing. And at the end of the inning, they led 10 to eight. Ten run, bottom of the seventh. Jimmy Fox, Al Simmons. I mean, this was the 29 innings. This is one of the greatest teams of all time and arguably arguably the greatest team of all time. But to put 10 runs up in the bottom of the seventh, come back and win 10 to eight, take a three games to one lead. And then they actually won game five with a rally in the bottom of the ninth, and they won the World Series on a walk-off. But – 10 run inning trailing by 80. That's magical. You know, I, uh, I don't know if it's ever going to happen and I don't know who would do it, but really there needs to be something done on the Philadelphia athletics. I mean, obviously Connie Mack and his three piece suit will always be iconic, but you know, you look at the hall of famers 
I mean, you're, you're, you're really, as you said, you're talking about one of the greatest teams of all time that no one really, they don't talk about anymore. They don't talk about it enough, and it was it's probably been maybe 20 years now where Sports Illustrated actually put the 29 A's on the, on the cover with the question mark, you know, is this the greatest team of all time? And it's a brilliant article. Uh, you can go back into the Sports Illustrated archives online and read it, and I, I encourage you to read it because you learn about this team and how great this team really was. And unfortunately, they're playing in the era of the Yankees, the Babe Ruth, Luke Gehrig Yankees, and they got overshadowed year after year. But the A's won in 29. They won in 30, and they went to the World Series again in 31. Uh, so they competed head-to-head with those great Yankees teams. And again, arguably the 29 team could be the greatest of all time. You know, we always have fun. You know, whenever Trout goes deep against the A's, you start to look at, okay, who has the most home runs against the A's? You go, okay, you look back at A-Rod and Paul Merrow and guys that played in the division. Who has the most all-time home runs against the A's franchise? That'd be Babe Ruth. And it's not even, what's he got, like 108? It's not even close. Yeah, it was an incredible number. Unbelievable. (laughs) I remember when I looked that up because I was like, because I think I actually texted you. It was like, you know, at some point it was like, is it it A-Rod? Who's got the money? Because Nelson Cruz is up there. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, Babe Ruth. Yeah, it's not even close. All right, number 10. Number 10, and this is 2006. This is the ALDS against the Twins. Game three, the A's are leading the series two games to nothing. And they're leading in the ball game four to two, going to the bottom of the seventh. And while this is so important, because this is the A's who continually lost in the ALDS in 2000, 01, 02, 03. They needed that, that big hit. And finally, this inning, this bottom of the seventh, was huge, right? And he didn't think it was going to be huge. It was two outs, nobody on. And it's only a 4 2 A's lead. So dangers around the corner, but with two outs, two outs, nobody on. The Twins intentionally walk Frank Thomas. Right? They give him the Barry Bonds treatment. That's how great Frank Thomas was. Well, they didn't plan on Eric Chavez walking next. So now they have first and second, two outs. Jesse Crane comes in, an error by Justin Morneau at first base, loads the bases. bases. Nick Swisher, a bases loaded walk, extends the lead, and then maybe the biggest hit, for that series, and that's Marco Scudero's double down the right field line. Clearing the bases, giving the A's a huge lead, and, and the A's, at that point, everyone in that stadium had a huge sigh of relief, huge lead, 8-2. to two, They go on to win the game. Uh, just a magical inning for that 2016. Number nine. Number nine, we're going to go to game one of the 88 ALCS. This is the A's. First time back in the postseason since 81, uh, 104-win team. They're playing at Fenway. Uh, again, in those years, it wasn't best record got home field advantage. It just flipped back and forth. It just, by the year of the calendar, decided if you were starting at home or on the road. So they just had to start on the road. They're at Fenway. It's a day game. But they're leading 2-1 to one going to the bottom of the ninth. And you know you got Eckersley on the mound. Eckersley gets a pop-up from Ellis Burks. Strikes out uh, Lance Parrish. Everything looks great right now. But then Jody Reed, who was always a thorn in the A's side, doubles. And Rich Gedman comes up, left-handed hitter. Eck works carefully to him and walks him. Walks Rich Gedman. Eck, who didn't walk anybody, walks Rich Gedman. And who does that bring up? Wade Boggs. Boggs, who had 366 over the year, who was his fifth career batting title, fourth straight. A guy who never strikes out, right? He only struck out 34 times all year. 719 plate appearances, only 34 strikeouts. And going down the stretch that year, he only struck out five times in the last 48 games. And X struck him out. And it was just huge. I mean, you talk about fist pumps from Eckersley. That was one of the best ones. He almost leaped off the mound. Striking out Wade Boggs, tying run on second base, Fenway Park, his former home. This tension was almost unbearable, and he strikes out Wade Boggs. So back in the early 80s, they didn't go – home field advantage was not decided by by record? No, just like the World Series and in the championship series, they were just uh, flip-flopped year by year, right? One year it would be you started in the AL East and the ALCS, and next year you started in the AL West, and, and that's what it was. They didn't change the best record until we went to the – really 94, but then 95 the first time it was implemented – with uh, the three divisions. 
Wow. Number eight. Number eight. We're going to go to game two of the 2001 ALDS. I mean, he's won game one at Yankee Stadium. Now it's game two. Tim Hudson, eight shutout innings, 113 pitches. The A's only have a one nothing lead in the top of the ninth. And the Yankees actually go to Mariano Rivera. And the A's score a run off Mariano Rivera. It's the only run they ever scored off Rivera in the postseason. It was unearned. It was a Damon triple. And then Miguel Tejada reached on an error by Scott Barocious, which Damon would not have scored on unless Barocious had kicked the ball. But it gave the A's a two-run lead. The A's take Hudson out and they put in Jason Isringhausen. And, you know, Yankee Stadium's on fire. There's Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney was, was watching the game behind the plate. Uh, first batter up is Bernie Williams, and he doubles. And then Tino Martinez comes up, and he walks. And now it's first and second. Yankee Stadium's coming off its hinges. This is Isringhausen. This is the 0-1 Yankees. They're not going to lose this game. And Isringhausen pulls up his britches, strikes out Posada looking, gets David Justice to pop out to third, and then gets Brocious to pop out to first to end the rally, give the A's a two games and then lead coming back home. We won't talk about what happened when they came back home, but that was a fantastic inning in such, such a setting. Yankee Stadium, 2001, unreal. Are you saying a starting pitcher went over – a hundred, a hundred pitches. Is that a hundred pitches, eight shutout innings, but still wasn't allowed to complete the game. And if, if you go back and you watch that game, most of these games are on YouTube. I had some, he wasn't losing anything at all, but at that point they were also thinking about later in the series, about using Hudson again. And you had Isringhausen who was coming off a great year, but eight shutout innings, but Hudson in Yankee stadium. Number seven, number seven, we're going to go to 1989. This is the ALCS against the Blue Jays, game one. And this was, this to me, really told you about the Oakland A's. This is what the 89 A's were like and how hot they were coming down the stretch. This is game one. The A's are trailing three to two. Dave Steve at this point is actually out pitching Dave Stewart. You go to the bottom of the six. McGuire leads off with a homer. Right? And that's just like, yeah, we're not, we're not taking this. This is, this is the A's. Homers, after a Steinbach strikeout, Tony Phillips comes up, bunt single. A little more bunting, a little more action back there, bunt single. They get State, Dave Steve out of the game. What happens next? Tony Phillips steals second. Running A's. This is, this is an A's team that took advantage. Uh, Mike Gallego, he gets a single, an infield single. So this is the bottom of the order, setting the table now for the top of the order. And this is where Ricky comes up. And Ricky gets hit by a pitch. Bases are loaded, brings up Carney Lansford. And most of you know my feelings on Carney Lansford. Uh, he was not a great clutch hitter. And this was also a situation where he was not a great clutch hitter. He hit the ground ball to short. It's a double play ball for sure. Except Ricky Henderson is all over Nelson Liriano trying to turn the double play at second base. He got a great jump. He went flying into second. Knocks Liriano over. The throw by Liriano goes wild. Two runs score on the play. The A's go on to win this baseball game. That was Oakland A's baseball. They show you the power, the speed, and also just the, the hustle and baseball acumen. This is Ricky Henderson, right? the all-time stolen base king. He's fast enough to break up a double play, and he got down there and made it happen. I mean, you're talking about over 100 pitches. You're now bringing up bunting. You're <laughs> bringing up stolen bases. Are you trying to get me fired? I'm just telling you, baseball, postseason baseball especially, a little <laughs> different than the regular season. And you have to do those things to win games and just the little things. Uh, and I was, you know, the A's go on to win that series. They win that game. And all because Ricky, the, you know, maybe the best player on the team, the future Hall of Famer, is hustling enough to break up a double play. Hey, were you shocked like I was that Ricky Henderson is just getting into the Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame? Yeah, that made no sense to me at all. I was like, how is this like, like, like when I saw it, I was like, how is a guy? Because I was like thinking, like you, you, you think of like the greatest players. Forget who played here in the Bay Area. Guys that were born and raised here. Like when I think about Ricky and I think about Barry Bonds, and I'm like, you're born and raised here, and you played here. I'm like, how is Ricky Henderson not in not in the Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame? That just like makes no sense. No, the only thing I could think of is they were waiting to make sure he was retired. <laughs> And by the way, he could get out of bed today and probably steal two bases. Number six. Number six. Uh, 2003, 
ALDS game one, Red Sox A's. Uh, this is a fantastic baseball game. Uh, the A's had to tie it in the bottom of the ninth. Uh, two out single by a Rubio de Razo, tied the ball game up, goes into extra innings. Uh, we're in the top of the 12th. Rich Harden, the rookie, takes the mound and immediately gets into trouble, right? Walks me into Ramirez, throws a wild pitch, and here comes David Ortiz, right? The, the new Mr. October is starting his Mr. October run at this point, 2003. But Harden strikes out Ortiz. He gets Kevin Millar to pop up. They walk Bill Miller intentionally. And then Gabe Kapler, future giant manager, Gabe Kapler comes up and hits a rocket down the third base line. Eric Chavez makes an unbelievable play to field it and then step on third to retire the side. Keeps the game tied. Go to the bottom of the 12th. Derek Lowe's on the mound to pitch. Durazo, he walks after a force out and a ground out by Tejada. Hatterberg walks. And while Hatterberg's walking, Chavez steals third. So now it's first and third, two outs. Hatterberg moves up to second on defensive indifference. Terrence Long is now walked intentionally. So bases are loaded, two outs. Ramon Hernandez is up. And what does Ramon do? He bunts. Bunts down the third base line. The element of surprise reigns supreme. As Bill King said from the broadcast booth, they go on to win game one, five to four on a walk-off bunt. Wow. I'll never forget that. That was phenomenal. Number five. Number five. We're going to go to the 72 World Series. And this is game two, bottom of the ninth. The A's are leading two to nothing with Catfish Hunter on the mound. Uh, Tony Perez, single to left, starts it off for the Reds. Dennis Menke comes up, hits a line drive to left. It looks like it's going to go off the wall. And Joe Rudy, the unbelievable catch, which was really the highlight of that World Series. It's still a highlight we see today. And you'll see it when we get to the World Series this year. It's always shown. Joe Rudy back to the infield, leaping up, making a catch. But that was only the first out of the inning. And that's the thing. What happens next is Cesar Geronimo comes up and he hits a rocket down the first baseline. And Mike Keegan, who had entered the game for defensive purposes, he made an unbelievable play just to record the out. So even though Perez moved up to second, now they got two outs. Now, Hal McRae singles, that scored Perez, made it a two to one game. And they brought in Raleigh Fingers at this point to get the last out which was the Julian Javier pop out. But the Mike Keegan play was just as important as the Joe Rudy play. It's just we don't see it all the time. Number four. Number four. We're just going to go to last year. Uh, this is the 2020 wild card series, game three. Uh, the A's trail this game. This is the, you know, the do or die game, and they're trailing three nothing. This is an A's team that has lost nine straight do or die games going back to game seven in the 73 World Series, and it's not looking good. Going to the bottom of the fourth, trailing three nothing, and after a Chris Davis ground out, uh, Robbie Grossman walked. Loriano struck out, so it's two outs. A runner on first, and Sean Murphy hits that big two run homer, and that changed that whole game. That home run by Murphy really saved the eighth season uh, in, last year. And the inning continued, and this is one of the few innings, really over the course of the last two years, where we've had the three batter minimum that really hurt the opposition team because they brought in. Cody, uh, they brought in Rodon to pitch, replacing Cody Hurer. He walks Tommy Lestella. Simeon double, so it's second and third. Then he's got to stay in for his third batter, which is Pinder. And he ends up walking him intentionally. That brings in Matt Foster. Finally, they can get Rodon out of there. They bring in the rookie, Matt Foster. He walks Canna. He walks Olsen. And finally, he retires Davis on a fly ball. But four runs later, the A's are leading four to three. In an elimination, in a do-or-die elimination game, which they haven't won, they actually go on to win the game. Uh, that was an amazing inning. Um, it's just a shame, and I'll always say that the people who weren't in the ballpark, and there were very few of us, uh, the intensity of that game was unmatched. <laughs> Number three. 73 World Series Game 7. Let's go back to the elimination, the last one that they've won. This is Game 7. The A's had to win Game 6 to stay alive. Now it's a 0-0 game in the bottom of the third. With one out, Ken Holtzman doubles. Yeah, the pitcher who didn't bat all year, right, because it was the first year of the DH. Kenny Holtzman doubles. Campy Campaneras comes up and homers. The first home run by the A's in the World Series comes in game seven, third inning. And then after a Joe Rudy single, Bando pops up, Reggie comes up, and Reggie homers. So they had homered the entire series, two homers in that bottom of the third, a four-run inning, 
The A's go on to win the ball game. Uh, Holtzman, Fingers, and Daryl Knowles. Uh, that inning, though, showing the power of the Oakland A's. God, I would have loved to cover the the, the seventies teams. When that would have, yeah. when that just been incredible, like to be be in the clubhouse and you know, you're looking at Catfish Hunter and you got Vita Blues a star and Reggie Jackson's the best player in the game. I mean, it just would have been, it would have been incredible to cover that team. Yeah, and I just hope that people, and I think the people who did cover it do appreciate it or did appreciate it, but probably not to the level that they should have because they really were watching greatness. A team win three straight World Series, playing in Oakland, playing with a with a hated owner who didn't want to spend money, and they were able to, to do this with such great talent, Hall of Fame talent. And the guy is running the franchise from Chicago. I mean, it's He's running from Chicago. Uh, he's telling the scoreboard operator from Chicago to flash go on the scoreboard when Campy's on first. <laughs> I mean, the whole, I just to cover it, the fights and all the things that they went through, it, uh, it would be phenomenal. All right. Number two, number two. And this, this is a great inning game for the 2012. We talked about the 2012 team, uh, ALDS versus the Tigers. A's are trailing in the series two to one. They trail in the ball game three to one going to the bottom of the night. Looks like this great season is, is over. And I remember because I was scoring this game. And I remember sitting up there and saying, just once, why can't we have, you know, that, that dramatic ninth inning? I've seen other teams do it. Why can't we do it? And unbelievably, 14 pitches later, we had uh, Jose Valverde, Papa Grande comes in, Josh Reddick singles to right on the first pitch, Donaldson doubles second and third, and now the A's have a heartbeat, right? Tying runs on base, down by two. Seth Smith rockets a double to center field, tying the ball game up, and he's staying on second. And George Tataris pinch hits. Again, the A tried to bunt him at third, and he ended up popping it up. Some bad bunt there. Cliff Pennington strikes out, but then Coco comes up, first pitch, base hit to right. Smith scores. A's dramatically scores three in the bottom of the ninth to win it. Again, it took only 14 pitches. It was like a blink of an eye when the A's had won that game. God, you're bringing back some 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 interesting memories. There's no question about it. And number one. So number one postseason inning, and we're going to go back to the 72 World Series. This is game four. The A's lead in the series 2-1, to one, but they trail in this game, go to the bottom of the ninth, 2-1. to one. And you talk about using your whole roster, especially in the postseason. That was this bottom of the ninth inning. Right, it starts off again. Our friend Mike Keegan grounds out, so one out. But Gonzalo Marquez pinch hits for George Hendricks. He's single, and he gets pinch run for by Alan Lewis. Reds bring in Clay Carroll. Gene Tennis singles to left, so now we got first and second. Don Mincher pinch hits for for Dick Green. Mincher singles, bringing in Lewis, and that is Mincher's last hit in the major leagues after a fine career. Uh, Blue Moon Odom. Pinch runs for Mincher, the pitcher, pinch running for Don Mincher. And then Angel Mangel pinch hits for Raleigh Fingers. And then Goel with the infield in, singles to right, scoring Gene Tennis. The A's unbelievably come back and win. They use three pinch hitters, two pinch runners to score their two runs and win the ball game three to two. Another fine top 10 in Oakland A's history. This has been a presentation of the Oakland Athletics.